it's time for more of what I had to drink yesterday. And, uh, well, this portfolio of wines will get me out of my chair on a Monday afternoon. And Seth Box, the director of education for LVMH, uh, was on hand, always informative. And, uh, you know, I love to taste with people where I can learn something from them about the wines. In addition to tasting the wines, which you learn a great deal about wine just by tasting it, but, you know, traveling there, uh, tasting with the winemaker or people like Seth that have an intimate knowledge of these products really is a treat. And, you know, be able to taste a couple vintages of Vintage Krug, Dom Perignon versus Enotech, 1996. I am there almost uh, uh, at a moment's notice. But uh, regardless, Monday afternoon, I try to take things light. Anyways, it's a good day to get me out of my office. And, uh, you know, for years, there's been no one in the champagne business that did the average, the everyday things, and the exceptional as good as Moet, Moet and Chandon. That's right, the E is pronounced because the accent after the E. And Moet and Chandon, uh, well, they make this used to make this product uh, uh, called White Star, that, a little bit sweet, wasn't even Britain style, the most popular thing in America. Well, one of the stupidest decisions I thought in the wine industry the last couple years was doing away with the number one selling product in America, but uh, these guys don't seem to have missed a beat. They have this Imperial product, which is standard now for the whole entire world. And uh, like I said, you know, I don't want to say it's pedestrian White Star, but it was a little sweet. And uh, Dom Perignon, on the other hand, this is a connoisseur champagne. Dom Perignon and Krug, two of the few champagnes that actually appreciate and value uh, greatly these older vintages at auction sell for big money. And, and I have drank numerous old bottles of Dom Perignon and Krug. Let me tell you, two of my favorite champagne houses. And Dom Perignon in a great vintage, like 2002, will produce one of the wines of the vintage. And then 2003 Dom comes out and what happened? I don't even know why they made a 2003 Dom Perignon. You know, just this vintage style is totally polar opposite of what the style of Dom Perignon is, which to me, Dom Perignon needs aging, you know, great vintages especially, but every year uh, it's one of these champagnes that uh, needs a little more time in the bottle to really fully express itself, and I was a little bit um, let down by the 2003, and like I said, most champagne houses did not make a vintage or Tete de Cuvée product in 2003 because of the extreme heat of the vintage. Well, anyways, most people don't realize this firm also involved, well, Own Chateau Yaquem, uh, Cheval Blanc. Um, well, they have a couple of joint ventures. They have the joint venture Cheval des Andes. Uh, they market in Cloudy Bay in this country, also Closa Palta. So some of the top luxury brands uh, from all over the wine world in this portfolio. And like I said, the champagne, enough to get me out of my chair on Monday afternoon, but these other great wines, Numantia also, which we don't have on the table, but from Spain, from Toro, just outstanding on the upper echelon of quality in all of these areas that they represent. All right, well, we started out with a little Moet Vintage 2002, and this 2002 vintage, an outstanding vintage. A dry style for this house, only about 5.5 grams of residual sugar. You know, to be brute, uh, I believe you have up to 8 or 9 grams of residual sugar, and, uh, you know, 5 grams. You definitely notice a difference. This is substantially different from their Imperial uh, Cuvée here. And uh, well, the fresh bouquet of apple, fresh dough, little light toasted almonds, some pretty floral notes as well. Smooth and creamy texture on the tongue. A hint of a kind of vegetal note on the finish, which, uh, yeah, very different style from their other champagnes. Fairly dry style, more of a connoisseur champagne, and a really nice bottle of bubbly, excellent juice. The Rosé 2002, also very nice. Red plum and spicy, peppery kind of floral notes uh, to the nose. A fine smooth creamy texture on the tongue and a little bit more of that vegetal note showing in this wine as well the rosé uh which uh you know definitely a sign of a more old world more connoisseur type wine here some tannins coming through on the end which you get with rosés which you don't get in the other type of uh, champagnes and i like this drier style uh, more earthiness from moe chandon excellent juice the rosé as well all right the dom Ruinart blanc de blanc a little fresher style aromas of almond a little marzipan surrounding the green apple and pear-like fruit notes of ginger spice there as well a smooth and creamy texture on the tongue, fine bubbles, and that chalky minerality showing through on the finish. Very clean, along with a hint of that ginger spice as well. Most excellent juice. One of my favorite champagne houses. Kind of funky bottle, but uh, really outstanding champagnes. Veuve Clicquot, vintage 2004. This is a riper vintage than 2002, so a little more forward. Notes of vanilla and brioche to the apple and plum-like fruit on the nose. Very smooth and creamy on the tongue. Lots of fruit. Rich, but nicely balanced with uh, notes of that chalky minerality and 
some vanilla cream showing on the finish. Really elegant, excellent bottle of bubbly, the 2004 Brooks. Boof Clicquot Rosé, 2004. A slight smoky, kind of flinty character to this. Looks at fresh dough bread coming through, some yeasty components to the raspberry and strawberry fruits. The Pinot Noir from this comes from Boozy and uh, you know, has some uh, tannin to it and some structure. One of the reasons I like Rosé Champagnes, uh, but lovely balance, very seductive floral notes coming through on the finish there. Excellent juice. The Dom Periano 3, as I mentioned before, you know, some peaty notes in this wine, uh, some things that would lead you to believe it's Dom Periano on the nose, but really sweet, ripe fruit and a little gardenia on the nose as well. Really pretty, smooth and creamy on the palate, but somewhat evolved. And, you know, Dom Perignon to me is a wine that needs aging. It's got great structure, which this wine just doesn't have great structure and acidity. A good Dom to drink in its youth. Dom Perignon Brut 86. We had a couple of 86s, the Enotech versus the 1996, rather, I'm sorry, uh, which is stunning vintage. The regular Dom is aged for just eight years and then disgorged the Enotech. The difference is they leave it an additional four Four years on the lease. So that autolysis, which gives wine this creamy, rich mouthfeel, heightened bread kind of dough aromas and floral notes and a little reduced astringency, you really notice this in the Enotech. But both of these wines are really stunners. You know, the regular Dom had that lovely kind of brioche and Servois character, a good amount of peaty and some of that spiciness that Dom has as well. And a really lovely thickness and richness on the palate. Really lovely development here and a hint of mints and of cashew nuts, a little bit of uh, that apple and candied lemon fruit here layered and complex coming through at the finish lovely length that chalky minerally note that you get from champagne and that smoky flinty nuance also showing through on the finish this wine's got decades in your cellar the 96 most excellent the enotech like i said this wine very similar but maybe i don't know it didn't seem quite as rich Oh, maybe the acidity in the other 06, but, you know, really similar bouquet of aromas and just seem to have a little more nuance on the finish. A lovely spicy bouquet of brioche, apple pear, vanilla cream, toasted almonds, just a lovely array of, of coming out of the bouquet here of aromas and lovely concentration and richness on the palate. I love old champagnes like this. After they've been open for two or three hours, they really do develop this lovely butterscotch kind of nuance in the nose, these older ones, and these kind of uh, mushroomy, earthy notes, which are fantastic. Uh, these wines just starting to develop a little. That Dom Perignon takes more time than most champagne houses. Killer juice to Enotech. And then the Krug. That's right, the 88 Vintage Krug and 2000 Vintage Krugs. The 8, 98, rather, one of the few vintages that has more Chardonnay than Pinot Noir. 98 was a great Chardonnay vintage. This is the only house to ferment in 100% barrels and 100% barrel aged wine. So really rich style. This guy's got ripe apricot and peach, quince-like fruit on the nose, and some more of that earthy, mushroomy nuance starting to come out in this crew. Toasty brioche, a lovely array of bouquet just lifting out of the glass. Really rich and layered on the palate. This wine has got everything and firm acidity also to boot, leading into a long and lovely finish. This wine definitely has more years to go in the bottle. Killer juice, the 1998 uh, crew. The 2000, lovely butter brioche on the nose here too. This is an oxymoron with this wine. Yes, uh, we don't need to say that. With crew, you're going to get that anyways. Really rich, a little bit more forward than the 1998, but every bit as complex and nuanced. A good amount of that ripe peach and apricot fruit with notes of toffee, cashew nut, earthy, kind of a mushroomy note showing there as well. Smooth and silky bubbles on the tongue and uh, lovely, like silk. One of the things I love about ch great champagne, the texture on the tongue and uh, some of those nuance from the nose coming through on the finish, but a little bit more generous, a little bit more fruit driven, this 2000 vintage. Most excellent juice. All right, next up, some of the still wines. We had Cloudy Bay's to Coco. We sent an offer out on this wine already. This was the wine I was most excited about after the tasting because one of the wines, uh, you know, really reasonable in terms of price for this high level Sauvignon Blanc, Mandarin Orange, kind of passion fruit, lovely tropical fruit showing, and a lovely uh, kind of salinity to this wine as well, a briny character, ginger spice, just a real complex bouquet of aromas, a lovely creamy rich texture. They stir this on the leaves to get a little extra richness in the textural components here on this, but wonderful balance and really distinct minerality, layers of flavor coming out on the finish and that pronounced that salinity kind of leaving your tongue salivating for food. I would hold this wine for another 10 years, even in the screw cap. Yes, folks. All right. The Casa L'Apostol Closa Palta, one of the most impressive wine, wineries that I've ever visited. You know, this wine is at higher and higher proportion of 
Carmenere in it every year. Carmenere, a great they thought to be Merlot. It's one of the lost Bordeaux varietals. You don't see it in Bordeaux anymore. It didn't take to the uh, rootstock after they had phylloxera, so they kind of uh, did away with it. 73% of this wine is Carmenere now and uh, really has a little bit of that kind of herbaceousness that you get from Carmenere's from Chile, but not a lot of it. Really international style wine, a full array of kind of toasty oat spice, vanilla, cocoa, white pepper, and uh, just a really exotic bouquet of aromas on the nose. Uh, certified organic in 2012. As I mentioned, I visited this vineyard in 2008. I was just blown away at the attention to detail, the winery that they created to make this one wine, and the vineyard just meticulously managed. And maybe, uh, you know, they showed me, rolled out the red carpet for me. That may have a little bit of an influence on why I've always loved the Close Palta and uh, I feel it's one of the greatest wines made in the world, not just in Chile. It can compete at an international level as the Wine pick Spectator picked the 2005 as their number one wine in their illustrious Top 100 a couple years ago. Most excellent juice this 2008. 2007, Cheval de los Andes. The vineyard was planted here in 1929. This is a joint venture between Chateau Cheval Blanc and Terrazas de los Andes. And uh, it's a blend of 60% Malbec and 35% uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and a hint of Merlot and Petit Verdot also in there. 18 months of new French oak. This wine has a lovely bouquet of thick black bl blackberry, blueberry fruit, uh, jammy and ripe hints of violets and fresh plowed earth, bittersweet chocolate, espresso. Just a lovely bouquet of aromas and really ripe and fruity. Uh, uh, just big and jammy on the tongue with lots of that nuance from the nose showing through on the finish. This wine's got big tannins, but man, they are ripe. Not quite as fruity as the nose, but in case, still has good freshness and balance. Most excellent juice. And then the Numantia from Toro, the big boy, made from 120 to 130 year old pre phylloxera vines. Only 6,000 bottles produced. That's under 600 cases. Uh, thick black earth, espresso, graphite, dark chocolate notes to the nose, along with a lot of cassis and dark cherry liqueur-like fruit. Really well endowed bouquet of aromas. Kind of a toasty marshmallow nuance to this note too. Really exotic. Big and chewy on the tongue. Lots of that dark berry fruit shown. Wild strawberry jam. Really exotic and lovely concentration with layers of, of the finish on this wine. Needs hours to open up, but it has tremendous potential. Uh, if you want a wine you can really sink your teeth into and you like tannins, man, this is it, the Numanthi from Toro. All right, well, check it out. We've got a bunch of older Dom Perignon in the store, a bunch of Krug and a bunch of wines that were on this offer, in older vintage wines in addition to these wines that we uh, had with Seth Box. I'm your host, Andrew Lampassoni, signing off for the Wine Watch, saying remember, always drink the good stuff first.